see a couple of young people come forward and tell us that they had invited Jesus into their lives. Uh, one was Miss Catherine, and she was baptized, I think, Brother Ricky was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. And today, uh, we have the joy of seeing Ben get baptized. And so, how, how does that, how's that for a refresher right in the middle of worship service? Amen. Amen. Written 
from a crisis time in his life. David says, beginning in verse 1, My soul waits in silence for God only. From Him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will you assail a man that you may murder him? All of you like a leaning wall, like a tottering fence. They have counseled only to thrust him down from his high position. They delight in falsehood. They bless with their mouth, but inwardly they curse. My soul, wait in silence for God only. For my hope is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. My stronghold, I shall not be shaken. On God, my salvation and my glory rest. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust in, trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Men of low degree are only vanity, and men of rank are alive. In the balances they go up. You, you get the image that David is using. He's talking about a balance. And, and whatever is light goes up, whatever is heavy goes down. And David says, such men in the balances they go up. They are together lighter than breath. Do not trust in oppression, and do not vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. Once God has spoken, and twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. And love and kindness is yours, O Lord, for you recompense a man to his work. At one time or another, every parent has reached that point of semi-desperation with their children's running and yelling and asking and demanding. Can I get a witness? Anybody ever been there? They, they will reach that point of semi-desperation that they will grab the child by the shoulders and look right in their eyes, right in their face, and say to the child, let's all play the quiet game. Now for those of you, and I know we've got some folks in our church family that have very young children uh, still in the crib, they haven't gotten to this point yet. Can I just tell all of you, it doesn't work. Sorry. But would it surprise you to know that when God sees us scurry about trying to fix our problems on our own, how quickly we give up or start complaining when he sees our general desperation and inability to handle the pressures of life. Would it surprise you to know that when he sees that, he comes to us and says to us very tenderly, If you look at the whole of Scripture, let me tell you what you're going to find. His invitations to play the quiet game, to come before Him patiently and seek His presence and seek His direction are scattered all throughout Scripture. One of the most obvious invitations to play the quiet game was visible in God, God's response to the prophet Elijah. And I know I talk about that story all the time, but it, was, it is one of my favorites. When Elijah was on the run from Jezebel, he was hiding in the cave. And God told him to stand up and go stand in the mouth of the cave. And Elijah said, I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to sit here and just sit here and sit here. 
recorded in the story of Elijah, the Bible just says very simply, but God was not in the wind, and God was not in the earthquake, and God was not in the fire. And then the Bible says that after this, uh, small, still voice. The American Standard says, the sound of a gentle blowing. And when Elijah heard that, he got up and he wrapped his scarf around his face, and then he went out and stood in the mouth of the cave. Why did he do that? Because he knew that he was about to meet with God. The quiet, the quiet was Elijah's signal that God was coming to speak with him. There, there's another invitation from God in the 37th Psalm. It, that psalm, I think, is a favorite of many people. And if you know that psalm, then you know that there is a series of basic steps outlined in the 37th Psalm that teaches us how to approach life and live it well. In, in that psalm, David says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way unto the Lord, and He will bring it to pass. And then it says, the next imperative is, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. And that word rest in the Hebrew means to be quiet. Be quiet before the Lord and wait patiently on Him. Why would the Bible say that? The reason is so God can get a word in edgewise. There's another invitation in Habakkuk chapter 2. Some of you will remember that in older days, uh, we used to recite Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20 when we came to worship. You, you know the passage, don't you? The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent. We used to recite that. Why, why did we used to recite that in worship? Why was that traditional? Because we recognize, as Habakkuk recognized, sometimes the best way to deal with problems is just to be quiet and let God deal with you. And to seek His presence. And to seek His direction. There's, there's another invitation in the book of Ecclesiastes. The writer of Ecclesiastes said, there is a time to talk and a time to be silent. But most of us, most of us, don't normally play the quiet game. Most of us neglect cultivating actual times of silence in the presence of God, and consequently, we do not reap the benefits of that kind of personal meeting with God. But there's good news. We've come this morning to Psalm 62, and in this psalm we actually have an example of this holy habit, waiting on God, being quiet before God. We have an example of this habit right in front of us, and not only do we have the example lined out for us, but there is also a strong word in this passage about how practicing this holy habit will help us in our walk. Now, we've read the psalm together. You may have noticed that the 62nd psalm is not technically a psalm about silence. It is mostly a psalm about the treachery of men and trusting in God. You can see the treachery very clearly in verses 3 and 4. To paraphrase what David said in verses 3 and 4 is he said to his enemies as if they were present with him as he was speaking, how long are you going to attack me? You would kill me if you could. You delight in lying about me. You bless me in public and curse me in private. And you keep pushing on me like I was some old fence that's just going to fall down on its own and you just keep pushing, and you keep pushing, and you keep pushing. And David says, I'm tired of it. 
the trust in God is just as clear in the psalm. David says over and over that he will trust in God in spite of the trouble that he is going through. And, and notice that four times in this psalm, he says he will trust only in God. God is his exclusive source of strength. And nobody else is helping David. Verse 1, my soul waits for God only. Verse 2, he only is my rock and my salvation. Verse 5, my soul, as he's addressing his own soul, my soul wait only for God. Verse 6, he only is my rock and my salvation. But even though this is a song about the treasure, the treachery of men and trusting God, what I want you to notice is the method of responding that David describes and I think prescribes. And that's the part I want you to get this morning. Twice in the psalm, look at it, in verse 1 and verse 5, David says, when you're in this boat, when you need the presence of God, when, when you got to have something, when the world is squeezing you tight, he says, wait in silence. Verse 1, my soul waits in silence for God alone. Verse 5, my soul, oh my soul, wait in silence. For God only. Verse 1 is a description of what he's done. Verse 5 is a self-exhortation. So what David is telling us, what we must not miss in this passage, David is saying, let me tell you about my devotional life. Some of the best times with God have been when I didn't talk. Some of the best answers for prayer came when I was quiet, some of the best peace I ever experienced flooded in when I just sat and waited. Did you hear what David saying? Some of the best times, the best answers, the best peace were all associated with being quiet before the Lord. Good words. Oh yes, we all we all want peace. We all want answers to prayer. Right? Yes? 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 You, how many of you would like for God to answer your prayers? Yeah, okay. We all want that. This, this is certainly something we're, we're interested in. But it's just so hard to do in our modern society because we stay so cotton picking and busy. We don't take time to pray. And even when we take time to pray, we keep talking and keep talking and won't pause to listen, and, and then we're gone. Our prayer lives sometimes are to run in, pray, run out, and our prayers sometimes sound like this. Give me this. Help me with that. Amen. Got to go. That's the way we treat God. And it's a product of our culture, I understand. I, I wish, I wish, I wish. If there was one thing I could get people to change about their devotional lives, it would be to teach them to wait and not rush. I think you're probably getting my point. But just in case, let, let me show you what David says in this psalm about the results that we can expect if, if we will cultivate this habit of once we pray, just wait and listen and spend some time with God. Look at verse 2. After saying, my soul waits in silence for God only from Him is my salvation. Notice how verse 2 ends. I shall not be greatly shaken. I I'm glad David put that word greatly in there because you know we all get shaken from time to time. But David says it's not going to tear you up. I shall not be greatly shaken. Verse 6, David repeats what he said. I shall not be shaken at the end of that verse. In, in both of those situations, David's talking about 
peace. If you will cultivate this, you will gain peace. We could all use some peace in this stress-filled world. How, how, how nice would it be to go to bed at night and say, whatever is happening, I will not be greatly shaken. Verse 8, David encourages the rest of us, pour out your heart before him. What David is telling us is, is that waiting before God is, is giving ourselves something of an open door to his presence. We, we find a place where we can just tell him everything. Do you sometimes when you pray feel like, no, no, I shouldn't mention that. No, I, I, God's probably busy with a black hole somewhere. I, I shouldn't bother him with my work problems. When you, when you gain that time where you realize that he's with you, when you wait for him, all of a sudden the whole, the whole extent of your life is just a wonderful opportunity to talk to him about. Verse 11. I love how David ends this psalm. It's, it's a little bit rhetorical. He says, I heard this once and I think God said it twice. The power belongs to God. Now, I don't know how I would fix this problem, but I can tell you this. I've, I've heard this before. David says, power belongs to God. So it's going to be okay. Peace, access, and confidence. That, that's what we get when we spend time in the presence of the Lord. Not necessarily giving, 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 but just Lord. I, I'm here. And I'm going to sit here as long as I can. And I want to know what you think. So the point of the sermon this morning, the reason I brought you to the 62nd Psalm, is I want to challenge you to try this. And, 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 and somebody right now is thinking, okay, here we go. Now let me tell you something. When, when, I, when I challenge you to try this, I want you to understand, I'm not talking about trying to create a mystical or unusual happening in your devotional life. All we're talking about here is that when you do your regular devotions, when you sit down and read the Bible and then pray, just add one more layer to it. Spend some time being quiet, waiting on God to speak. I remind you of a verse that, that you know well, Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall. Okay, a verse you don't know well. I'd say the 40 and 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. There you go. Yeah, keep going. You know, when we think about that verse, we, we put all the emphasis on they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. In this psalm, the reason David is talking about waiting in silence is because he's letting us know what has happened in his own life and how it has blessed him. He is encouraging us to try this. I'm encouraging you to try this. And I don't want to just send you out with, uh, okay, try this. I, I want to leave you with some pointers, so let, let me end this morning by giving you some tips. If, you, if, if you're thinking right now, well, maybe I can try it. Let me give you some ideas. Number one, don't be in a hurry. The opposite of waiting is hurry. And I understand that that's the way most of our lives work. We're always in a hurry, but hurry is the opposite of waiting. You cannot rush God. By the way, God is bigger than anything else in our lives. God is bigger than anything else in the world. He doesn't operate on our timetable. So if you want to try and spend time with God, 
look at your heart and you think, hey, I'd rather spend time with God than the other thing that I might could be going to do. As you wait, be interested in experiencing His presence. Feel for it. Look for it. Think about it. Expect it. Ponder the impossibility of being anywhere actually outside of His presence. David said in Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thoughts. You are intimately acquainted with all of my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, you know it. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. You realize God desires to be with us. He's behind us. He's in front of us. The only question is if we're going to let him be involved in our present. Number three, look forward to the way that God's presence changes us, particularly cleanses us. You realize when God meets with you, sometimes he brings to your attention some things in your life that need to be fixed or changed. And if he does that, be obedient and don't hesitate. In the 32nd Psalm, David said, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long for day and night. Your hand was heavy on me and my vitality was drained away like the fever heat of summer. But when I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide, you forgave the guilt of my sin. Don't be in a hurry. Be interested. Be open. And number four, if you sense his leading while you're waiting for him to speak, if you sense his leading, worship. But we had a, again, I want to thank Stephen. This is such good music this morning. He realized that Sunday morning is not the only time you can do it. You, you knew this? Yes. If you have a hymn book at home, as you're sitting there, be quiet, open, sing. If you don't have a hymn book at home, you just take your Bible, open it to the book of Psalms, pick any psalm. They're all psalms. You, you, psalms are psalms. Pick, pick any psalm you want and sing it. Make up your own tune. Mine are all kind of in minor key when I try this. Uh, which means I should never be a songwriter. Good news is I'm not. Uh, what, what I'm telling you is it, it, whatever, whatever you want to sing to the Lord, it, it doesn't have to be perfect, just make a joyful noise. And the Bible promises us that God will receive it. How many of you have ever made up a tune? Yeah, I know, but it's about the effort. Number five, if you feel blessed at this point and you're waiting for the Lord, and it would be no surprise if you did, then express your thanksgiving to God. Praise Him for whatever comes to mind. We have so much to be thankful. And I think if you're spending some time waiting on the Lord, a whole lot more probably come to mind. And if you're thinking, well, this I'm going to be here all day. Okay. Spend a little more time being thankful for all that God brings to your mind. But number six, this is the last one. Ultimately, ultimately, I, I've talked to you about not being in a hurry, talked about thinking about His presence, talked to you about uh, anticipating the way that He will change your life. Talk about worship, talk about thanksgiving, but ultimately, number six, the point is to be quiet.
Francis Fenwick said, do not seek God as if he were far away in an ivory castle. Because he is found in the middle of everyday life. If we will listen. If we'll just stop and be quiet. I'll leave you with one other quote. This is from the prophet Zephaniah. Zephaniah in the minor prophets in the Old Testament. How many of you can say, yes, I was just reading in Zephaniah. Not, not an often read book. In Zephaniah, the prophet says these words. Listen to this. Listen. The Lord your God is in your midst. And he will exult, exult over you with joy. And he will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. And get that. Sounds good to me. You know what the price of it is?
guided them in various directions, but I, I hope you're also speaking to various ones in our congregation and saying, try this, try this. Let me come and be a part of your day. And I pray that as you say that to various ones, Father, that we'll be obedient, as we should be obedient to you in all things. So use this time now, Father, whatever you want to say to us. We want to hear it. And we want to respond. We say that in Christ. Amen. Brother Stephen is going to lead us in a chorus. This is your time. If God is speaking, be obedient and respond to him. That means spending a moment at the altar. You know your room. You come. That means making a decision where you're sitting or sharing a decision with the church. You be obedient to that as God knows. Brother Steve.